Before the Fellowship was the greatest story you've never heard. I'm Greg. I'm Cameron. I'm Dan. Join us as we read and react to The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Last episode, we met some of the Valar, the Lords of Arda, and today we will continue reading Valaquenta. The spouse of Ale is Yavanna, the giver of fruits. She is the lover of all things that grow in the earth, and all their countless forms she holds in her mind, from the trees like towers and forests long ago, to the moss upon stones, or the small and secret things in the mold. In reverence, Yavanna is next to Varda, among the queens of the Valar. In the form of a woman she is tall, and robed in green, but at times she takes other shapes. Some there are who have seen her standing like a tree under heaven, crowned with the sun, and from all its branches there spilled a golden dew upon the barren earth, and it grew green with corn. But the roots of the trees were in the waters of Ulmo, and the winds of Manwe spoke in its leaves. Kementari, queen of the earth, she is surnamed in the Eldaran tongue. The Feanturi, masters of spirits, are brethren, and they are called most often Mandos and Lorien. Yet these are rightly the names of the places of their dwelling, and their true names are Namo and Irmo. Namo, the el elder, dwells in Mandos, which is westward in Valinor. He is the keeper of the houses of the dead, and the summoner of the spirits of the slain. He forgets nothing, and he knows all things that shall be, save only those that lie still in the freedom of Iluvatar. He is the doomsman of the Valar, but he pronounces his dooms and his judgments only at the bidding of Manwe. Vaire, the weaver, is his spouse, who weaves all things that have ever been in time into her storied webs, and the halls of Mandos that ever widen as the ages pass are clothed with them. Irmo, the younger, is the master of visions and dreams. In Lorien are his gardens in the land of the Valar, and they are the fairest of all places in the world, filled with many spirits. Este, the gentle, healer of hurts and of weariness, is his spouse. Gray is her raiment, and rest is her gift, and she walks not by day, but sleeps upon an island in the tree-shadowed lake of Laureline. From the fountains of Irmo and Este, all those who dwell in Valinor draw refreshment, and often the Valar come themselves to Lorien, and there find repose and easing of the burden of Arda. Mightier than Este is Niena, sister of the Feanturi. She dwells alone. She is acquainted with grief and mourns for every wound that Arda has suffered in the marring of Melkor. So great was her sorrow as the music unfolded that her song turned to lamentation long before its end, and the sound of mourning was woven into the themes of the world before it began. But she does not weep for herself, and those who hearken to her learn pity and endurance and hope. Her halls are west of west, upon the borders of the world, and she comes seldom to the city of Valimar, where all is glad. She goes, rather, to the halls of Mandos, which are near to her own, and all those who wait in Mandos cry to her, for she brings strength to the spirit and turns sorrow to wisdom. The windows of her house look outward from the walls of the world. Greatest in strength and deed of prowess is Tulkas, who is surnamed Astaldo, the Valiant. He came last to Arda to aid the Valar in the first battles with Melkor. He delights in wrestling and in contests of strength, and he rides no steed, for he can outrun all things that go on feet, and he is tireless. His hair and beard are golden, and his flesh ruddy, his weapons are his hands. He has little heed for either the past or the future, and is of no avail as a counselor, but is a hardy friend. 
His spouse is Nessa, the sister of Oromi, and she also is lithe and fleet-footed. Deer she loves, and they follow her train wherever she goes in the wild. But she can outrun them, swift as an arrow with the wind in her hair. In dancing she delights, and she dances in Valimar on lawns of never-fading green. Orome is a mighty lord. If he is less strong than Tulkas, he is more dreadful in anger. Where Tulkas laughs ever, in sport or in war, and even in the face of Melkor, he laughed in battles before the elves were born. Orome loved the lands of Middle-earth, and he left them unwillingly and came last to Valinor. And often of old, he passed back east over the mountains and returned with his host to the hills and the plains. He is a hunter of monsters and fell beasts, and he delights in horses and in hounds, and all trees he loves, for which reason he is called Alderon, and by the Sindar Tauron, the lord of forests. Nahar is the name of his horse, white in the sun and shining silver at night. The Valromra is the name of his great horn, the sound of which is like the upgoing of the sun in scarlet or the sheer lightning cleaving the clouds. Above all the horns of his host, it was heard in the woods that Yavanna brought forth in Valinor. For there, Orome would train his folk and his beasts for the pursuit of the evil creatures of Melkor. The spouse of Orome is Vanna, the ever young. She is the younger sister of Yavanna. All flowers spring as she passes and open if she glances upon them and all birds sing at her coming. These are the names of the Valar and the Valier, and here is told in brief their likenesses, such as the Eldar beheld them in Amman. But fair and noble as were the forms in which they were manifest to the children of Iluvatar, they were but a veil upon their beauty and their power. And if little is said, if little here is said of all that the Eldar once knew, that is as nothing compared with their true being, which goes back into regions and ages far beyond our thought. Among them nine were of chief power and reverence, but one is removed from their number, and eight remain. The Ardatar, the High Ones of Arda, Manwe and Varda, Ulmo, Yavana, and Aule, Mandos, Niena, and Orome. Though Manwe is their king and holds their allegiance under arrow and majesty, they are peers. Surpassing beyond compare all others, whether of the Valar and the Maiar, or of any order that Iluvatar has sent into Ea. <laughs> So, we got to hear of the rest of the Valar. I want to hear what are your what's your favorite Valar or Valier um, of all? Because we just met them all mm -hmm. last last week and this week. So I want to hear your guys' favorites. They're all are so unique, and they I don't know. I, I it's hard to pick one. <laughs> um, but I know on my first reading, one that really stood out to me and I, I do appreciate a lot is Niena. Um, Niena? She kind of captures um, just sympathy. <laughs> um, she She's like kind of a, a consolation for people that are in sorrow and troubled. Am I thinking of the right one? <laughs> the spouse of Namo? Is that what you're talking about? I think it goes back to that uh, meme we were, we watched last time. <laughs> Where it's like, wait, who is that character again? Uh, wait, oh, okay. So, so yeah, she's the she's the one of or she's the sister of. We're already going back like, yeah, for, yeah. like twenty some pages in. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> Ooh. So so okay so this might be it. the fan Tori are two of the Valar and that's it's the hard part is that they're given two different names but what they will 
be called for the most part after this are Mandos and Lorien. Mm, yeah, and that it was just, interesting it, that there was a it, difference in the the naming of them. And right, the and more, it notes more common one is the one we know him by Mandos, but then you have these other two names that is actually well, he dwells in Mandos, which is interesting. Right. He's named after the place he dwells, right. just like Lorien is. I never noticed that before. It's crazy. So Nienna is one is their sister. And she, I guess she's like the melancholic one of them. Yeah, it's like it's really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> she, uh, it says she's acquainted with grief and mourns for every wound that Arda has suffered. And uh, I wonder, I mean, it, and it mentions too, I, I see that someone highlighted um, the sound of mourning was woven into the themes of the world before it began. And I don't want to steal anyone's thunder if you want to talk about that, but I know we had mentioned when before the world actually begun, they were able to, they had visions of the music, right? And darkness was incorporated in, and um, there was discord in it that Melkor sewed into the music. And I wonder if um, this kind of mournful music is tied with that. I'd, or I don't mm. know, maybe that's a, that's an interesting question. Was there mourning before there was ever, discord. or, you know, there wouldn't have been grief, right? Before, this sor this like darkness was sewn into the music. Yeah, that's a good um, point. And it and it's almost like you know, mightier than Este is Nienna, right? She's acquainted with grief and mourns. The sound of mourning was woven into the themes of the world before it began. And it it's almost as if there's something to her power in her grief and her suffering. That there's power from that place. Hmm. Um there's an implication there just with it being, you know, woven into the themes before it began. Um, it's kind of cool. I, I remember Peter Kraft once asking the question, um, why is sad music so much more beautiful than happy music? And uh, hmm. there's something very beautiful about sad music or tragedy. And um, so, yeah, I would say that her theme comes as a response to the discord of Melkor in the original theme. That's what I would think based on, I don't think you can have um, the grief and the sorrow um, without that. But then you also can't have the deeper, more meaningful beauty that comes out of the grief and the sorrow, right. which is. What and that's kind of, um, that's kind of up. a part of a theist answer to the problem of evil or suffering in the world. Right. That, yeah that there's these higher goods that are possible because they're suffering. And she captures that really beautifully. Um, one of the lines here says, she does not weep for herself and those who hearken to her learn pity and endurance and hope. Oh, that's and, so cool. You know, they really like, because there's conflict in the world and darkness in the world, there can be hope and endurance. And that's something that she can teach to each yeah. And even on a psychologist, I mean, we're talking theology, we're talking psychology, we're talking literature, but on a psychological level, I think it's Brene Brown talks about how, um, you know, if you shut off in your life, pain and suffering and sorrow, it, it doesn't just kill that. It actually kills your ability to enjoy things as well. You know, we mm -hmm. might, we, we've probably all heard of people who just stop feeling mm -hmm. period. And they, it usually happens because they can't, you know, process the amount of pain they're suffering with. Mm -hmm. And so they just learn to numb that, but it also makes it impossible for them to enjoy something that is good because it's just, they're just numb. So there's this like beauty, the, theologically speaking, it's a, it's a beauty that came from suffering and is the, is the, is the greater thing than the evil that was there, right? Mm -hmm. But then for us, there's something to learn from it as we're reading it that like this sort of mourning has power. It, um, it can give us enduring hope. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting to see. I don't know if, if she shows up in the rest of the Silmarillion as a kind of um, anchor of hope for the characters, but it would be just in exciting to see what, what happens with, with her. Yeah, definitely. Did either of you have a favorite... Vala or Valia that you wanted to bring up? Yeah, my, mine is Ulmo, um, 
who we heard about last week. So he's the Lord of the Deep Waters. And I talked a little bit about him. I think it was just last week. Um, and I don't, I don't quite know why I like him so much. I think there's something um, so... Well, you hate people, and and he likes to go to lonely places. So, <laughs> Dark, I think you're quiet. just like, yeah, I wish I could do that. Like, you know, deeps of the sea, and just like hang there away from everyone else. Val, Val no, or the uh, Valar are all hanging out on this mountain, like the party, you know, um, singing songs and making storied webs. And then <laughs> Ulmo is all alone, thinking his. <laughs> deep thoughts <laughs> yeah it, maybe it's my melancholic tendency that attracts me to this one but um i think it's also i'm projecting back because Ul ulmo i mean it said it in our reading last week is he he's very concerned with what happens in middle earth or i don't know if it's it's called middle earth but he's concerned with what's happening and because he's the lord of the waters he's connected to the earth in a particular mm -hmm. way. So he actually shows up at, at certain moments and it's a, uh, it's always epic when he shows up the, the Lord of the water. So, um, but I, I would probably give Matt Mondos a second place. <laughs> like he's, I really like him hey, too. He's mine. You can't take okay, him. You, then you talk. I like the Mandalorian the best. Mandos, <laughs> we'll call him. Uh, he is, yeah, I just like him. I like his, uh, you know, his hunting and horses, and I don't know. There's something to that. And Wait, you're thinking of uh, Tulkas? Oh, am I thinking Tulkas? Oops. Or no, they Mar both are hunters, aren't Arome. they? They're... Arome. Shoot. Mondos is like the the judge. Because I saw He's you nodding one... and smiling when he was reading about Arome. Oh, okay. I knew well, it. I That's the one it. I like. Okay. He's the one who like, loves all the beasts, the yeah, fell yeah. beasts, delights in horses and in hounds. Yeah, yeah. I like all that right, one. So, yeah, you talk. I'm sorry. Um, I thought that was Mandos. Um, but yeah, Orome, I guess I like. <laughs> Tell me about <laughs> Mandos, because now I don't know who he is. So he's the spouse of Nienna, I think, right? I get that right? So the one who mourns and sorrows with mandos who's called namo at, at first but he, he goes by mandos later um she's the one mourning for all those who are suffering but he's the one who speaks judgment oh, the doomsman and he's the doomsman yes and sometimes yeah. he speaks his dooms depending on whether luvatar is like yeah all right you can just like really make people feel bad about themselves yeah what i like is later on there will be like what's so cool is when you meet these characters they're so epic and kind of unreachable but then they'll talk and it's so exciting like what are they gonna say and obviously tolkien's a master of the english language so it's like oh that's exactly what ulmo would say that's um, awesome and in the way he'd say it but when when the valar are talking and then um mondos like they need to understand they, they need to hear from mondos like everyone hushes it's like now it's <laughs> mondos's time to speak and it's always Oh yeah, just the the Lord of Doom and Judgment. It's just so epic. It, there's something so epic about that. And this line, uh, he forgets nothing, and he knows all things that shall be, save only those that lie still in the freedom of Iluvatar. He is the doomsman of the Valar. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, just I mean, you would you would assign that usually those characteristics with like a villain or something, just like. The Grim Reaper, you know, yeah. pr pr yeah. pronouncing doom, but the fact that it's one of the mighty lords of Iluvatar, it's just really cool to me. Yeah, in Christian theology, it's the angels, right? That's They're the ones that know pretty much everything except that which is in the mind of... That's true. Like, reserved to the mind of God, and that's, that's... I mean, Satan being the kind of... He was an angel, he fell, he's a fallen angel, but he had that... De he has that depth of knowledge, right? that depth of intellect, but can't fully know what's in the mind. I mean, in a way, he, he is the Melkor. Um, hmm. But that's cool. Hey, I have a question before we have to wrap up. Um, it seems that the, I, I, I don't remember it from the, the previous readings, but there's, there's the, this mention of the Eldar, right? And um, that's in this chapter a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't think we've been introduced to who they are and what their role is yet. Am I right in that? I mean, I know that the Eldar include all the elves and they're kind of like, I don't know, sub the Valar. Um, do we have any, any other, or is Tolkien just throwing ideas on paper and not really explaining them? What's going on? Well, I think this goes back to uh, the foreword that we read from Christopher Tolkien, who explains yeah. that a lot of this was written, it wasn't written to be a novel. It was scraps of different ideas that he kind of edited together. So, and the time, you know, I don't know how they were ordered for this publication, but um, I do know that we're wrapping up Vala Quenta soon. And once we dive into uh, Quenta Somarillia, and that's when that will be made more clear. Maybe even okay. in book. So this, this uh, I guess, short story, the Vala Quenta is really mainly about the Valar and the Maiar. Mm. Um, so the, the elves, the children of Iluvatar are referenced, but they're not really part of this story. They're not around yet. And so it is kind of making, so where I'm reading it, 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 ref, it kind of refers to the Eldar as, you know, it's in this case, it says, these are the names of them uh, and their likeness is shared such as the Eldar beheld them. Uh, but they haven't actually come yet. So it's just kind of, I guess it's more of a linguistic thing at this point. Sometimes they're called this by the Eldar and they have a separate name or. According oh, okay. to the index, which is the most referenced part of my copy, <laughs> I always <laughs> go to the index of names. It says um, the name Eldar, which means people of the stars, of the stars yeah. was given to all the elves by Arome. But it yeah, came to be referred to a specific group of the elves. The ones who set out on the great journey, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just reading in the, the encyclopedia, and it says, <laughs> Avada, it says, the first Eldar awoke some three ages, roughly 4,300 years, before the first rising of the sun. What? <laughs> This is great. So well, you, you, you just have still, to. You just have are we to. Are still in darkness right well, now? You, you just have to slow down a little bit because these things will be answered. But um, <laughs> <I'm> blown. <laughs> there's not. Things aren't really created exactly as we know them. We're in just later meeting stories. the people. We, we haven't Dang. seen what creation is yet. But there's so much imagery of creation. Like, you know, the, the what is it, Yavanna or who, I well, don't know who it was. Well, think the, of it this way. Green, I mean, we read the music thing. of the Ainur, and that was a vision of creation, but it, it wasn't really creation happening. It was the music, the vision of the music, and then as they kind of entered into Arda. And then the, the Valar are interacting with the creation, but it's not really describing what the creation is. Like, we hear about right. beasts and waters and stuff, but we don't get a context yet. Right. But wow. that's coming. Okay. We'll okay. get there. Right, we'll get cool, there. Cool. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, that's a good place for us to end right now. If you like what you hear, go ahead and rate us three Silmarillions out of three. Follow us everywhere at Before the Fellowship and send any comments or questions to beforethefellowship at gmail.com. Join us next week as we read The Greatest Story You've Never Heard, The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Thanks, guy. <laughs>